Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm Steve Rosen. Welcome back once again to my YouTube channel. Hope everybody's well and happy and uh, staying strong out there. So, um, what you're about to listen to here is an interview I did with Diamond Dave, David Lee Roth. David Lee, Mr. Roth. Um, uh, this interview probably took place somewhere around the beginning of 80. Women and Children First was just about to come out, and Dave talks about that. So um, I know that they had finished recording it in February, and actually the way that Dave talks about it, it sounds like they, the recording was done. Um, so this is probably somewhere between February and March uh, 1980. So, uh, yeah, man, you know, uh, Dave is Dave, and he's big and loud, but, uh, you know, man, he can be funny and insightful, and, uh, you know, at the time, you know, 1980, um, I mean, everything was happening for the band. So, uh, yeah, so you can understand his enthusiasm. Also, uh, this is just a little precursor to a major... Van Halen related audio multi seven part interview, which will be coming up in the next few weeks. Maybe, um, maybe we'll unleash this beast uh, around Christmas, New Year's, somewhere around there. Uh, but it's pretty special. Uh, I think I think you people will really love it. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, so. That being said, sit back, grab a cup of Jake, uh, make a cup of tea, make yourself a sandwich. David Lee Roth, 1980. Be good, everybody. And he says, what did you like? A dangerous <laughs> band. And 1980 is going to be a very dangerous year for a lot of civic leaders, a lot of media people, and a lot of religious types. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be the best. A lot of people try to make Van Halen go away. Whether it's uh, people in the press or people, a uh, number of radio people or people, uh, critics or... Uh, you know, anything like that, because Van Halen looks just like everybody's kids these days. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have freaky, strange haircuts that are out of the ordinary. And we aren't, you know, don't propose some political platform or something like that. And so, uh, you know, in most of the press these days, the critics and stuff are over 30 years old. And they don't want to see their kids in the <laughs> being pictured like this in the press and in the, in the pictures and stuff. And so... Uh, they try to make us go away. They try and pretend it's the ostrich syndrome, you know, <laughs> head, in the, head in the sand, ass in the air. Well, that's where Van Halen comes in. We are the kings of the drop kick when the ostrich syndrome comes in. And this year is going to be one big field goal, man. It's going to be real good this for us. Oh, yeah. The 80s is it. Belongs to Van Halen. We're the youngest and we're the newest, and it's, it's coming on real strong. There's a number of bands that are coming on. I like all kinds of music. New Wave. I like Reggie, reggae. <laughs> and, you know, all different kinds of things. But Van Halen, by and large, is, is, the, is the youngest and the newest and the biggest thing coming on. And the uh, last two years just been warm-ups, you know, and you grab the ropes and just kind of do a few knee bends and go uh, uh, hyperventilate a little bit, and then the gates are open, and this is the 80s. It belongs to me. You sense that Van Halen could very well take the place of people like like Purple and Zeppelin and well, and, and it's not so much you take the place of anybody, but that this whole business, music business and entertainment, man, turns around. What's happening now? By the time you answer, it's too late. Something else is happening, <laughs> and uh, you know you don't replace people because music lovers, entertainment people have big hearts, you know, and whereas you have a Deep Purple on one side mm -hmm. and you have uh, a Bob Marley on the other, well, it's very easy to squeeze in a Van Halen or a Blondie or a Knack or an Aerosmith or whatever it is. There's always room mm -hmm. for something new. 
And I say, bring them all on, new blood, all the time, every day. There's always wolves at my door, man. <laughs> I'm, so I'm not, always on my toes. You and, on you know, toes. I mean, you're not afraid of that. Oh, no, not at oh. all, not at all. But it's the kind of thing where I like it when there's something inspiring out there, some kind of music or a show or a combination, something sexy, something dangerous, something mm -hmm. funny, you know, just that's keeping me on my toes. And it's the same for the rest of the band mm -hmm. where it's like, Hey, you know, got to go out and put it out. Music mm -hmm. is born of effort. Nobody puts more effort out than Van Halen. Mm -hmm. Remember, there's only four of us. That's less than most bands, so it's concentrated. Right, <laughs> right, right. So you can chop all this up, Ivory. Oh, it's, it's great. You're you're you're, uh, <laughs> you're a very illuminating guy. So ask know? me a second question. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 still is the biggest rush for the band? Is it is it the studio stuff or is it live stuff? It's there's no difference. Our studio stuff, as I'm sure Edward may have told you, is the same as our live in that we record in a very large room. We pick our studio on that basis. Is it what has the livest, most vital now sound to mm -hmm. it? And we record that way. Same equipment we use on stage and same everything. I take a towel and a change of clothes when we go down and I sing while they're playing in the booth. You know, I'm separated by a piece of glass, but actually, I'd say 60% of the vocals that you hear on the last two Van Halen records and the brand new one, which is called Women and Children First, by the way, Great. is... Uh, women, plural, and? No, women and children first. As in, charge! <laughs> or save them or something, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, we record the same way. Almost no overdubbing, very minimal overdubbing. And we only use that to make up for the lack of visual. Because which would you rather be, deaf or blind? <laughs> you don't got to answer me. And I can tell what the readers are thinking right now. Because they're reading it. They're not listening to this magazine. So it's like right. you got to have something that feeds you through your eyes as mm -hmm. well as your ears, you know. And uh, we make up for that in the studio with a little echo or a little bit of overdubbing. But we try and keep it very natural. Van Halen sound spills over the edges of that record mm -hmm. when you put it down on the turntable. Now, you've seen the beer commercials on TV. Nobody pours a glass of beer that goes right to the top. We all want to see it go <laughs> all over the edges and onto the table and into the camera. And that's what Van Halen sound does on the records. Uh -huh. It just goes boom and you, it erupts all over your record player and <laughs> onto the rug. And that's that's human, man. That's real. It's super real. And that's what Van Halen de deals in, super real. Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding you when I say something on stage and I tell a story or I say who likes to do this or that or whatever. That's not jive. That's real, man, for better or worse. We leave all the cracks in the woodwork. <laughs> you know, It's all there for public view, you know, for better or worse once again and it's the same thing on the record there's a lot of laughter there's a lot of running noses there's all kind of everything that's human is left into the van halen records you uh -huh. know because we're dealing in four people personalities and the music and the visual and everything serves to project that and say hey here's us what about you so then you'll sit down and you'll sing live with the band Absolutely. And maybe if you have a harmony, it'll be an overdub. Um, even, yeah. Well, the guys can't sing while they play. Right. But they go in and they'll do it stock as opposed to recording. Look, I'm, I'm not the world. I ain't no Caruso. Okay? And, uh, but I could damn well get in there with our producer, Teddy Templeman, who's one of the finest, and go over the same line 55 times for you and get it musically perfect. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can do that. But you've never heard that yet on Van Halen records because I don't want it. <laughs> and that's the reality. That's it. You know, a lot of people, and it's a valid way of recording. It's cool with me. I'm not putting it down. A lot of people will go and really work over something until it is perfect musically and it sounds very smooth and shiny. But Van Halen does not do that. I prefer jeans to shark skin pants. <laughs> And uh, that's the way we do everything, whether it's the album cover or the production of the sound or the lyrics or my haircut or whatever it is, it's done. Here it is, man. This is real. First take stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
And that's why you'll hear a lot of things in Van Halen music on the records that are, you go, oh, that's a screw up. But it's got a charm to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something there, you know. The first Beatles records, the first Elvis records, the first Led Zeppelin records were all recorded on the first or the second take. Mm -hmm. And even though it wasn't perfect musically, you know, like uh, some of the bands who go for the real clean, perfect sound would be like UK or Boston. And I enjoy both of those bands' music, but Van Halen opts for a dirty stage as opposed to a nice clean one. I'd rather I'd rather trip over beer cans and, than lay down on a soft velvet cushion, you know. And I think most of the world would rather do that too, because that's the way we are. Uh -huh. So, how long have you been in the studio? Mm -hmm. Well, it goes on and off because uh, this is California. And this is Van Halen, which adds up to last minute <laughs> every time. <laughs> you know, adds up to wait until the last minute every time. And so, you know, we go in for a few days, and then we go out for a few days, and then, uh-oh, it's New Year's Eve. And, uh-oh, every night is New Year's Eve with Van Halen anyway. So, <laughs> you know, we're not actually delaying. We're just wasting time, which is kind of <laughs> it's sort of been my occupation long before music. And like, so you know, get a tire on a chain, and hang upside down on it. I come up with a lyric for you in a couple of days. But it's like goes like that. Actual time though. Getting back to the question, was I think four or five days for the basic tracks. You know, which is all of the music. And uh, first day and a half of that is spent getting the sound of each individual instrument. You make that bass drum sound exactly like you want. You make that guitar sound exactly like you want. Everything. Get the sound just right so it goes onto that tape just like you want it. Mm -hmm. And then you're done. You know, you don't spend six years mixing down and throwing up, and, you know, and you don't spend nine weeks doing vocal overdubs and stuff like that because I get bored real easy. Man. I was I was brought up just like the rest of the guys on a heavy, heavy diet of television and radio. And that means I can't last more than 12 minutes with anything without needing a commercial. <laughs> I take that back. I can think of two things I can last 12 minutes more on, but, or more on. But, but anything besides those, and that's a whole nother interview, is, is uh, you know, you get bored quick. Van Halen songs are short. You know, it ain't like I ain't got a lot to say, but it's, uh, I get bored even with what I have to say. And so you got to switch the subject. You switch the beat. You switch the key. Change keys, man, you know? Get out of the studio. Fucking, I'm tired of recording. Let's, you know, let's go somewhere. But, uh, you know, it, it goes real quick. I and mean, I think that's the pulse of the world in the 1980s, man, is, is zap, pow, instead of, oh, mellow, you know? And uh, that's what I see on television and radio and everything since that, those were my parents, man. And that's right where we are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you can you talk about some of the tunes? How they came together, where they were written? Well, I can without getting into the specifics, once again the title of the album is Women and Children First. And the bulk of the material was written on the road in the back of the bus or the submarine or whatever. This last tour? Yeah. And uh, the lyrics were done at the same time. I do all the words and you know, everybody goes over everything, so they are in actuality group compositions. But you will sit down initially, write a set of words, present to mm -hmm. the band. Eddie might have a riff. Let's sit down and see if they'll work yeah. together. Yeah, well, what, it, what it really happens is Edward comes up with a seat of the music, and uh, we finish the music, and then I sit down and listen to it, and right away I know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. I can go, oh, cowboys. <laughs> and then we think of a cowboy title. You know, you say, oh, uh cowboys are dead or alive yeah <laughs> you know so you know it's 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 very simple actually it's folk music delivered with high impact <laughs> is what it is and uh you know you can turn off the vocals off of van halen music and chances are you'll get the subject matter right anyways <laughs> even if you can only speak japanese you'll know what we're singing about and playing about 
generally it's about those two things that I can last longer than 12 minutes on. <laughs> but that's all another interview. <laughs> <laughs> Third question. Fire <laughs> that so So the road is a is a source of uh, the world inspiration. The world is a source of inspiration, and the best way to get into the world is go on the road. <laughs> You know, I love people, man. I love to sit in the lobby and look at people. I want to see what kind of shoes they're wearing. I want to see how what they get high on. I want to see what they eat for dinner and what time they go to bed and once they do when they're there. <laughs> what they do. And it's like the best way to see all of that is to go on the road. Because in rock and roll, you go on the road, everything's four or five times as much of everything four times as quick. Mm -hmm. The big deal on the road is being able to absorb it all without exploding. Mm -hmm. A lot of rock stars exploded in the last few years. <laughs> That's a whole nother interview. <laughs> like, you got to be able to soak it all up without, you know, ODing on it. And uh, I, per I personally participate in everything. You know, because I get a big kick out of it. That's living life, man. Mm -hmm. I didn't get in rock and roll to make money. You know, I didn't get in rock and roll to make girlfriends. I didn't get in rock and roll just to make music. You know, I got it to get out there and live. And you use the music to tell people what you live in, mm -hmm. what you see, mm -hmm. what it's, what's happened to you, what's happening to them. Because it's probably the same thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know it is. I take pride in it. I ain't no rock star. This ain't no Jim Plant or Robert <laughs> Dandy or anything like that. Man. This is like, hey, you know. We live it, and then we write about it. Mm -hmm. um, so the album will be pretty much similar music style to uh, Van Halen 2? Well, will there be any kinds of new things uh, going on here? Yes, we have uh, a keyboard that we're using on this album that sounds very different. No, don't freak out. Don't turn the page. This, <laughs> it does not sound like any other keyboard you've heard on record or otherwise. <laughs> Van Halen has systematically destroyed the concepts of electric guitar and big drums and screaming. Now we're destroying the concept of keyboards and we're going to go on from there. Mm -hmm. It's uh, everything on this next album is delivered with heavy impact, you know. And so the attitude, the Van Halen attitude has not changed at all and uh, nor will it ever. <laughs> it's like that's the natural thing. You can't change that. All you can really change is the instrumentation and the and the beats and the, you know mm -hmm. and the music and that sort of thing. But uh, as far as resemblance to the first two Van Halen records, no. I think Women and Children First makes the first two Van Halen records look little mm -hmm. <laughs> by comparison. The sound, the music, the songs themselves are ultra entertaining, and they don't sound. You know, without you having here, it doesn't sound like the first two records mm -hmm. at all. This is like, like I said, it's when you grab the ropes and you do a few knee bends mm -hmm. and then bing, the bell goes off and pow, it's 1980. Mm -hmm. That's where we are right mm -hmm. now. All those first two were warm-ups and this third one is whoo. It's, <laughs> it's going to be the big one. This is the big kickoff for Van Halen. Mm -hmm. We're going to run the whole field all the way through the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, the keyboards? Um, yeah, it's a cheap shit Wurlitzer played through Edward's Wall of Marshalls. <laughs> yeah. Wurlitzer sort of piano? Yeah, electric piano. And uh, another junk store model, you know, I recorded Ice Cream Man on the first album on a junk store guitar for a hundred bucks. And uh, the Wurlitzer didn't cost much more. And, uh, you know, there's another acoustic tune on uh, Women and Children First. Those are junk store models, you know. Van Halen, I think, in itself is a junk store model. <laughs> We're taking the basement to the world, <laughs> you know. And uh, no matter where you go in the world, basements are all the same. I think that's why Van Halen is clicked. <laughs> Everybody can relate. Oh, yeah, I've been there. I slept there. <laughs> you know? Are you playing the piano? No, no. I don't have a musical note in my body. <laughs> And none of my none of my influences are musical, by the way. But that's a whole nother in, interview. <laughs> but uh, Edward P, Edward played it on the uh, on the tracks. 
and uh, Michael will probably play it on stage. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple setup, but it sounds like Van Halen, man. That attitude just oozes out of every groove, mm -hmm. even on the piano tune. The acoustic tune I mentioned before that, uh, is called This Could Be Magic. And uh, it's the same thing. It's, it's got a feeling, you know. You don't, you, we don't shoot for musical perfection. We shoot for does it feel good. Mm -hmm. And if it does, then it is good. Mm -hmm. What else we got going? Let me think of the other tunes. We have other songs that are great guitar rock. You know, this is a guitar, drums, and singing band. But uh, the, the shape of the songs is different. You know, we haven't lost the beat. We haven't lost the intensity or the vibrations, whatever. But uh, it's, they've changed. The music has grown. It hasn't matured. God, how I hate that word. <laughs> but it has definitely evolved, you know. I've, I've managed to keep myself from maturing since we got on the road 18 months ago, but somehow I've evolved. I'm <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't get better and it doesn't get worse, but baby, it sure gets different. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, better or worse is a, is a judgment for somebody to make when they mm -hmm. hear it mm -hmm. and when they see the show. But I can sure tell you that it's different, and I'm jazzed, man. Mm -hmm. The whole band is jazzed, and the whole world's going to be jazzed with us when they hear this. Okay. This is something else, because it's not like rock that you've heard before. Once again, though, we're not going Mahavishnu, mm -hmm. techno rock, and no, we're not playing reggae tunes, and no, this is not new wave, and <laughs> I haven't cut my hair. Next question. <laughs> Is there, is there a title track on there called Women and Children First? Well, This Could Be Magic has a chorus that goes, uh, Lonely ships upon the water, better save the women and children first. Sail away with someone's daughter, better save the women and children first. Which is where we picked up the title for the record. Because that's an attitude. That's a feeling. You know, and, and male and female alike can have that attitude. It's kind of a... You know, we put one finger in the air when we're on stage. You say, charge, number one, here we go. The innocent villagers, yeah. <laughs> you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, you can't break it down into ex exactly what does this mean because I wrote the fucking thing and I don't even know. <laughs> it's like, but it definitely feels good. Like mm -hmm. I said, if it feels good, it is. And that just felt right, man. There's a conflict there. There's some tension there. There's something happening, and you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? And it's like, wow, that's the whole feeling of the record. That's the whole feeling of Van Halen, anybody who knows this band or who's going to get to know it. As a matter of fact, even if you don't want to get to know it, I'll come down and get to know you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be by at six. Turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you run down any other song titles? Uh huh. <clears throat> we have one called Romeo Delight, which is uh, it's a uh, it sounds different. Edward's using different ways of playing the guitar, which he's real good at taking the same old six string instrument and fucking it all up. Man, he's he's. He, he saws his guitars into pieces and then glues them back together and he gets these strange sounds out of them. Then he figures out a way to play it differently by putting his fingers over here instead of there and by twisting this and turning this down and breaking this up. <laughs> and it's like, so he's always coming up with new ways mm -hmm. of playing the instrument, much less things to play. You know, and uh, so there are some very different sounds. And Romeo Delight has some real interesting sounds and approaches to playing the full blast electric Hello. stun guitar, which is what Edward is the king of, according to guitar player this year. So it's uh, it's power rock, you know. It's it's you know, twice as fast as your heartbeat, <laughs> but it's like, how is he playing that? You you might not even recognize the instrument yet. It all can be duplicated on stage stage mm -hmm. much better because then you can feel it mm -hmm. then i'm gonna go and then i'm gonna walk down and grab you <laughs> it's like yeah it's better when it's live because you feel that sense around earthquake movement you know but on the record same thing with the piano tune is a, a lot of people will listen to it at first on the on the on the record and go 
wow, what did he do to that guitar? Well, it's not a guitar, but it's a piano, you know? And they'll listen to Romeo Delight and go, wow, what'd they do to that piano? Well, that ain't a piano, <laughs> that's a guitar. And he's not using any fancy technical equipment. He's not using any synthesizers or anything. It's just the kid, he's down in their basement with the rest of us, and he's just, like I say, he's twisting things all out of shape. And I, I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> You know, yeah. what else do we got? Let me look at a thing here. Oh, the uh, title of the piano tune is called And the Cradle Will Rock. And the Cradle Will Rock. That's kind of like almost biblical, don't you think? That's the closest I ever got to the Bible. And we got another one. It's called Loss of Control, which is super extreme. That's like turning everything up to 78, which is, you know, you know how late on a Saturday night or something, you feel like turning everything on to 78 and blowing out all your fuses and then going, ah, well, that's what the song does. It's like it, it starts out real slow and then it just goes zip <laughs> to 78. And you'll think your, your tape recorder is all jacked up. But <laughs> and you listen to it and it's live. In the studio, once again, we haven't we haven't, we haven't screwed with any kind of tape speed or anything like that. We just wanted to turn everything up full blast. You know when you get a car and it's got the funny little red marks on your tachometer, your speed out, <laughs> and it says, it don't go here. That's right where you want to go. If, you're anything, if you have any Van Halen in you at all, it says, attention, attention. Do not tear this tag off the mattress under penalty of rip. <laughs> You know? And that's, that's, what, that's what we've done, you know. And uh, usually it's kind of even a, a battle with the producer sometimes to keep us from turning everything all the way up into the red zone. You know, the needle isn't supposed to go in the red. Well, that's where Van Halen lives, man. Let's say, you know. Past the over the edge, you know, go to the edge. On the first album, we went to the edge and we looked down. On the second album, we didn't discuss the matter. And on the third album, we find that Van Halen has jumped over, so, <laughs> has jumped off the edge. So, you know, and loss of control is probably the reason why. Uh, let me think of another team for you. <clears throat> oh, here's a classic. This one's called Everybody Wants Some, parentheses, I Want want some too. Everybody, Everybody wants want some. some. I want some too. Complete with jungle sounds and a Tarzan yell really? and the exotic erotic drum beat. That's where the religious leaders are going to come in on this song. Remember I mentioned that at the beginning of the interview? Right. And then what else does that song have in it? Oh, a lovely little monologue in the middle of it that was totally impromptu. All the best parts of our music are just made up on the spot. Heavy pressure. And the reason there's usually so much pressure that makes us produce so well is because we wait till the last minute. <laughs> you see, I keep referring back to what I said before. And you get there and you go, okay, we're going to do some singing now. Well, while I'm standing there waiting for the tape to run, I damn well better think of some words, huh? <laughs> and that's usually when it comes out the best. And so this song is full of that real fast, impromptu stuff, you know, um, just off the wall lyrics and you know the music is real it reminds me of the jungle and that's definitely an attitude of everybody wants some i want some too you know that's that's got to be rock and roll <laughs> you know? um let me think of one more do 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 fools this one, yeah, this one's called Fools, and it's a uh, real heavy-duty Broadway shuffle. It's, but this ain't Broadway, baby. <laughs> you know, don't turn the page. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, uh, it's a real stroke. It sounds like city streets at night, you know. What did some writer wrote? What did he say? It was great. He said, reminds me, Van Halen music reminded him of uh, high moons, Windless nights 
and car crashes. <laughs> That's definitely what this one says. It goes, you know, I ain't about to go to school and it's the final bell for pushing broom. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's the attitude. That's, that's the kid that the cradle will rock. Sings about. He's singing his own song in that one. So it's all very personal music. You know, it's all very personal words. It's, it, it definitely comes from the heart mm -hmm. or some part of our body. <laughs> <laughs> Above or below the waist. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Depends on where your heart is. <laughs> yeah. So how many tunes are there on the album? Mm, nine, I think. Nine. Yeah, there's all kinds of little intros and stuff are that there? we do that are different from before. Uh, done on the same instruments and with the same classless attitude. <laughs> it's... Uh, is Eddie doing any solo things? Mm -hmm. Like I say, in the songs themselves, he's playing the guitar so many different ways now. Has literally invented different ways to play the same instrument that they take on the appearance of solos. I mean, if you wanted to just turn off the rest of the track, you could just listen to the guitar. Mm -hmm. And the intros to the songs are different than the songs themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like little works or little, I don't know what you'd call them. And we wrote them. <laughs> like, but it's a very entertaining album that there's all kinds of different bits and pieces as well as the songs themselves. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say? Yeah. Once you hear it, it's 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 simple. Uh, it's a very, a very simple concept. And I don't deal in concepts. We deal in attitude. But it's like, you know, there are little bits and pieces that lead up, you know, kind of lure you in, you know. So all these tunes were written specifically for this album. There was nothing mm -hmm. that was maybe... An idea maybe hatched for the second album? There were a couple. There were a couple, but they've been redone so much. You know, like I say, Van Halen hasn't so much grown as changed. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it gets seems to get a little more wilder and a little more out of control, but with style, <laughs> you know? And so you take something that's been done before, and, and it's it's out of control, but just ain't got no style. Now you wouldn't go out with a chick like that, would you? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you're gonna look for somebody with some style as well as whatever. I don't know about your personal taste, rock fans, but <laughs> and the same for you know chicks look for that and guys, right? You know, you want that wildness, but you gotta have a little bit of style mm -hmm. to it. And so, uh, you know. That's what we've done. It's, it's, it's changed in that respect. So when you take something that's done before, like Fools, the original riff was done several years ago. But once we got done changing it with our current style, then it sounds very much different. Mm -hmm. And and so it shall go. Now, I ain't, now, keep in mind, I ain't saying you do it with class. Because class means money. And class means neckties. And class means certain things. And I don't want to have no limits, man. No limits in this biz. That's why I'm in this biz. That's why I'm in Iraq. And that's why Ed and Al and Michael is. It's because you don't want to have those limits. And so you do it with style, which just means your own personal way of twisting things. Is there a pressure on you as the band gets bigger and bigger and more people hear it to, to come up with something that's uh, better and better? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you I don't conscious worry. of that at all and going and saying, listen, man, this has got to be hot? No, actually, I've got one of the best jobs in the world and that I can avoid all that. There's a lot of people saying it, but I just don't have to listen to it. I don't have any bosses, you know? I, I don't have to punch the clock to go to work, you know, anymore. And it's like you can just be yourself and do your thing, you know? And... Uh, it's like, that's the beauty of what we're doing, is that we don't have any bosses and pressure. The critics scream, and a lot of people scream about, oh, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. Well, look, if they want to go see somebody who's, you know, spouting a political uh, platform or some new political wisdom or saying your lifestyle should be like that, that's okay. I might go see them, you know, it might be worth eight fifty, but probably not. <laughs> I like to get off, man. I like to get up there. I like to get out. I like to get so high you get out. That's when you can't see what's below and you start creating your own 
world, you know what I'm saying? In the music, in the lifestyle, the clothes you wear, the language you use when you're talking with mixed company, whatever it is, you create your own style. And that's, there is no pressure on Van Halen because we do sell records. And, uh, and I guess luckily the people are into what we're into. But even if they weren't, we'd still be doing our natural selves. And for a long time before the big record company discovered us, we were just doing our natural selves and everybody's screaming, no, you can't play this bar, that's the wrong kind of music. No, you can't wear that haircut. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. And uh, in from where we come from, which is in Southern California, when we got together, we have a little saying when you get pressure like that and people start nailing you to limitations and everything. It's a very old folk saying and it's two words, it's fuck them. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know? and that's that just about covers it you know? it's like you don't worry about it because once you try and change once you try and pimp yourself to somebody else's ideas unless it's really you people are going to know it now that's something invisible in the music or the show but if you're faking it people pick it up mm -hmm. they pick it up quick too and that's you know and uh Van Halen, like I say, I'm no Caruso, and uh, I don't look like uh, Valentino, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, it's real, and I mean it. I damn well mean it, and so does the band. When we sing about what we're into and, you know, saying no limits and that kind of thing, that's really our feeling. And I think that's the thing people pick up in Van Halen more than anything else, is that this is really happening. You really do exist. No, I don't go take my costume off and put on a necktie after the show. And no, I'm not lying when I say, hey, I like this. What about you? Or hey, I do this. What about you? Or hey, have you ever done that? <laughs> you know? It's like it's real. And there are so many fakers out there. You know, I can't say anything about people's music or people's lyrics or people's show or something. But I can nail them. A lot of people for not really being what they put themselves up to be on the stage or in the movies or on the radio or the newspaper and that goes for more than just rock stars that's politicians and parents and all the way down the line you know and uh, that's the thing people I think respect the most is when you ain't lying you really put yourself up there and hopefully you're the real you is big enough and expansive enough that it's going to reach more than just a small crowd of people mm -hmm. that 80,000 people will be able to pick up on the real you. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I've always been an exaggerated cartoon character my whole life. So it's just now I'm up on stage. It's a difference of what, six feet from the audience? You say, Dave, you've come a long ways. Yeah, six feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Add another six, that's the stairs to the basement. Twelve feet, man. I've come twelve feet in ten years. Great. Next. <laughs> you know. Ted and uh, Don work on this album. All twelve feet with us, man. <laughs> it's the same thing. And uh, they did the first two, and they did uh, Women and Children first. And uh, it's the same same concept. I'm hesitant to even use the word concept because that suggests hippies and that suggests sitting around being mellow for long, long, long periods of time, you know, and like that. And that's just not where I'm at. But the concept is one of no limits and just go with it, which would, which would suggest that we're going slow when you say just go with it. You think slow, right? Well, no. Van Halen goes at 78, like I said. If you just tell Edward, okay, just uh, play something. <laughs> He'll jack it all the way up to 78 before you, you know, before you even know what you've said. And it's like, they go with that. And, and the combination is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It makes good sounds, man. It makes great records. It makes great attitudes, philosophy, there's some sort of philosophy in there, some sort of moral, but I don't know what it is. You know, I just feel it. <laughs> I feel a presence. <laughs> Where did you record it? Sunset Sound. Same place. Up here, yeah. It's uh, one of the largest rooms in Southern California, and uh, that gets a very live, very real now sound. Not now as in what's, what's happening or what's the latest fad, but now as 
you are there. Mm -hmm. It's right in your face, right in your ears. Mm -hmm. Van Halen will be right inside your body, just as my words are right now, rock fans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about uh, anything like uh, microphones that you're using or any anything on that end? Type I don't, techniques? Uh, Do you know anything? The techniques, I don't know about specific equipment because I'm not that technologically orientated, but as far as the techniques, Van Halen specializes in using twisted technique, which is out of the norm, off the wall, something different. Try, let's wrap wax paper around this. Mm -hmm. Let's try this one laying down. What would this sound like if we play, if I sang it sitting down instead of standing up? What if we put the microphone right above my head and I sing straight up vertically? into it as opposed to laterally mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to try these kinds it. of things oh sure and that's how you change the sound subtly of a guitar drums and singing band mm -hmm. because that's basics but i still believe basics is best you know can change position but you're always gonna well that's another <laughs> interview <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you, you know, the way Edward plays his guitar. Yeah, it's a it's a fairly stock guitar with a fairly stock amplification system, but he's playing it all weird. He's switched the controls completely opposite of what everybody says this makes a nice sound. Edward will do the opposite just for the sake of feeling that he got away with something. <laughs> you know, he'd say, well, you pick with this hand and you play the frets with this hand. Well, no, Edward goes, no, I want to bang it with my forefinger up here and then pull it here and it, it makes a different sound. Mm -hmm. As far as singing, I like um, one song we sang outdoors, you know, it's just for a, a it gets a different sound. You, you know? recorded it outdoors? No, we record the vocals outdoors. You know, we went out and sang it and it's like, you'll hear it on the mm -hmm. record. It's obvious and it creates a feeling, which huh. is what we're talking about, all the invisible things. Uh, as far as singing straight up, you know, into the microphone, it's a very different sound out of my throat. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, you know, I tried, I heard somebody tried singing laying down. That didn't work for me. I fell asleep. You know? <laughs> <laughs> when they got the tape rolling. But uh, as, as far as the technical, it, it doesn't appear to be uh, state, state, state of the art. Now, I read about digital recording and all this sort of thing, and what we use is, once again, the basics is best. We're recording on 24-track, and it's a very high-quality studio, Sunset Sound. is. a lot of records have been recorded there, but it seems that for us, the forte is that live, raw, overflowing sound. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, a lot of other places we have recorded in other studios for whatever and just putting songs on tape or you know writing material or what have you and uh, it gets a very studio sound which gets us right back to not having any limits i don't even want walls around our sound you know yeah. a lot of sounds you see you hear what you hear walls around it mm -hmm. as if it was recorded in a studio and halen does not have that Van Halen's sound has no walls around it. It's, it just explodes and keeps radiating outward. You don't have the effect of the guitar in a room or this drum is in a booth. Mm -hmm. It has the effect of being outdoors, being on some giant stage somewhere or being on another planet somewhere, you know, but it has no walls around it. Mm -hmm. Was it an easy album to make in terms of uh, the sessions running smoothly? Oh, yeah. Well, Van Halen's course. sessions run just like <laughs> Van Halen after work, which runs just like Van Halen getting out of bed, which runs just like... <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it stops and starts, and then you get... And what you get are long runs of 78 RPM, man. <laughs> and then everybody goes, ah, I'm bored, I'm tired. Yeah, later, let's go get some sushi or a hamburger or whatever. So and, you do that in the middle, you just go out and take oh, some yeah. time off. Oh, yeah, and... because it's all that energy, man. It's all the impact, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's not so much of did you hit the note right at the exact right time. It's just how did it feel, you mm -hmm. know. And, and you use up that energy, man, you know, and... I mean, how long is a horse? 
you know, how long is a horse race? You think, oh, wow, it's a big horse. It's a little jockey. But actually, it's not that long. <laughs> you know, the track itself is not that long. And you think, wow, you know, it's, you use up that energy. Pow, for that. That's the 80s, man. You know, some people burn their candle in both ends. Some people burn their candle in the middle. And some people take a flamethrower to their candle. <laughs> well, you ain't going to have your candle too long, but it sure is going to burn bright. <laughs> and that's where Van Halen comes in. I carry a microphone. <laughs> I was working the night watch out of juvenile, as usual, when a phone call came in. It was either the blonde or Logan. Either way, it spelled trouble. That's when Ed came in. He carries a guitar. <laughs> Uh, Sorry. <laughs> uh, do you sense anything being a single, or does that come much later? Yeah, and the Cradle Will Rock will be the first single. Really? Yeah, and it's got a oh, it's great sound, and it's different. It doesn't sound like any other rock bands, and it and it sounds like Van Halen to the max, but different mm -hmm. than we are all accustomed to because it is another instrument, it is a keyboard. It's hot. But there's no mistaking it. I mean, the minute you hear it, you'll know who it is. But you won't recognize the instrument right off the bat, which will give you cause to think, is this foreigner? No, it could be them. <laughs> is this Boston? No, hell no, it ain't Boston. That's v v v v Van Halen. You pull over to the side of the road. You jump out of the car. You forget that you've left your girlfriend in the car. You grab her. You run to the record store. You empty your pockets. Out of it. Oh, yeah, the innocent villagers blocking to the altar of sound. <laughs> nah, you know, it's just, it's, it's, this is a soundtrack for something, and I don't know what, you know, there's a lot I don't know about this stuff, you notice. <laughs> That's the beauty of it, the mystery of Van Halen and, and Echo. And it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a soundtrack. I do know I propose the toasts. <laughs> you know, but uh, you notice when we come out live on stage, we don't use big, you know, intro tape because this is not to be looked on as a performance, quotation marks, or an act, quotation marks. This is like I'm walking in the back door and going, oh, hey, long time no, oh, hey, what's your name? Well, hey, let me propose a toast. Yeah. And then we take it from there. <laughs> you see? So it's a very much more personal thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not putting on an act for somebody. I'm not faking anything. And uh, just, I guess people by and large are appreciating it or can relate to it or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I'm making a living. <laughs> I guess. The only difference would be if people didn't like it, I wouldn't be making a living. I'd still be doing it, <laughs> but I wouldn't be making a living. Wouldn't this? Sure. So the whole band is real happy with it. Oh, yeah, everybody's ecstatic, man. Everybody is euphoric. Everybody is dying to get out on the road. We're going to go around the world, oh, yeah? and we're going to hit some new countries. We're going to hit up Latin America and Scandinavia for the first time this year. Australia is on the ticket. Uh, United States, heavily, heavy United States extravaganza, full blast European vacation through every country. Nobody, nobody shall escape. <laughs> when, do you, when do you start in the road? Uh, middle of March. We will start out on World Extravaganza Vacation 1980s. Mm -hmm. That's plural. <laughs> when, when's the album due out? Uh, about beginning of March. Beginning of March. Beginning of March it should really uh, become real evident. Like I say, a lot of people try to make Van Halen go away, and uh, we don't see that, uh, take that personally at all. But it's it's kind of like, you know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And uh, I can always console myself by knowing that if Van Halen never made it or anything, we can always go circus. <laughs> Believe me, man, if you gave me $500 and said, go circus, and I started to mess with my hair and screw around with some clothes, I'd blow your mind. You might not buy my records, but you'd sure buy my picture. <laughs> but that's not real. So, you know, it's always my parents say, Dave, you need something to fall back on. I tell them I'll go circus. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is showing my behind. <laughs> <laughs> Have there been any tunes that anybody else has sang lead on beside you? Uh, no. Did no, that ever happen? Everybody sings harmonies and the backups and, you know, sings along. But uh, I figure there's reason for being in the band as a lead vocalist. Mm -hmm. That's probably because I could do it better than him anybody else in the band that's why i don't play a lead guitar <laughs> and you know it all overlaps it's not like i decide everything that happens with the voice you know everybody we criticize and argue and the whole time always <laughs> you know and everybody suggests things it's, you never hear anything like what do you know about playing drums mm -hmm. you never hear something like that or what do you know about singing because actually none of us really know for sure about anything mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> i mean who does you know and and so you know somebody says oh i think this looks good or that doesn't sound right or this is great and this stinks and it's like it, it you know it all overlaps mm -hmm. but nobody else sings lead i don't think they can get as much a kick out of it as i do <laughs> you know so pretty much the tunes are worked out during rehearsals and stuff. Mm -hmm. and oh, yeah, almost completely worked out in rehearsals. But then again, there's the Van Halen syndrome where, you know, you know, you get it pretty close and then go, ah, let's wait till the last minute. And then you really get something that explodes. And then you really get something that's spontaneous, that ignites, man, because you're under pressure. The people are putting pressure on you in the studio. You know, you're paying money to record and there's the engineers are there and something and you don't have the words just right or the music isn't just right and all that pressure is there then you're really going to have something that just goes kaboom mm -hmm. it might go kaboom really bad <laughs> some you know sometimes you get something that just explodes just righteously and it's like wow where'd that come from it's because like you're on maximum so the new tour will be uh Composed mainly of the new album? Uh, yeah, it'll be centered around the main, you know, around women and children first. But you got to play the hits of yesterday as well as the hits of tomorrow. So, <laughs> so and it all sounds the same to me anyways. I don't know about you. But, <laughs> you know, like I say, you know, it's all 78 RPM, man. It's zip, zip. And, uh. It's all just different facets of one attitude, mm -hmm. you know, one feeling, you know. And, uh, we'll, you know, it'll be a hodgepodge, just like my apartment is. <laughs> we'll just throw stuff in, you know, with that, you know, and see where it lands. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't super plan the Van Halen set. It's a very natural thing. You put songs in, you change them on the tour, you do different tunes than you do when you start it on the tour. And uh, keeps it very interesting. You know, same as you do with your clothes. You don't want to wear the same pants every night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There'll be no cover tunes on the album? <laughs> uh, nothing by anybody else. This is the first Van Halen LP that is completely original as far as all the songs were written by us. But mm -hmm. I like to think that even the songs that were by other people sounded distinctly by Van Halen. They, those songs were Van Halenized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like you took something like You Really Got Me and uh, that's a terrific song, no doubt about it. But the way when I listen to it on the old single, it sounds like a biplane. <laughs> and Van Halen took it and streamlined it and... and I don't know, what do you call it when you make it into a jet? <laughs> you know? That's what we did. We made a jet out of it. And that's a t totally different airplane. I mean, it's still an airplane, still a song, same song. But there's a big difference between a fighter plane and a biplane. You know? And it's like, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing with uh, You're No Good was like we had played the song in the bars and even when I try to sing like somebody else, it comes out sounding like Dave. So, well, that's, you know, there's the difference there. And so, you know, we always have the original material, but we like other songs too. 
a song is a good a song is a song you know it's if it's good once it's good forever and you can change the production on it and you can turn up the guitars and turn down this or you can you know push the vocals up front or something with a song but a good song is always going to be a good song mm -hmm. and so down the line we may do other people's material you have no compunctions about doing that it's the same thing as stealing hubcaps. They're yours. <laughs> <laughs> They're on your car. <laughs> Possession's nine tenths of law. That's right. There's a rumor out that people come up to me and say, hey, whose song is Van Halen going to do on the next album? I go, what do you mean? They go, well, you know, we thought it was like the thing that they do other people's songs. And well, people like to, you know, that's yeah, what you do is you, you give them just enough so that people think a trend is starting or whatever. And I, I get a kick out of shaking people up, you know? I mean, it's sort of a perverse pleasure, but one of the main Van Halen drives is that, is the need to not just walk up in front of somebody and warmly shake their hand and say hi, but the need to sneak up behind somebody and wait until they're real quiet and watching television going, bah! <laughs> that's one of our major driving wheels <laughs> and all four of us have that excessively <laughs> so you know if that gives you any better <laughs> sheds any more insight or light on the subject <laughs> so, so what point are you uh, with the album then oh uh, we're gonna finish patching up vocals you know doing the overdub for you know the choruses and shit like that this week It'll be all done. And uh, what is the mixing process like on a Van Halen album? It's well, it's it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's uh, both the simplest and most difficult. The simplest because you only have guitars, drums, and singing, and the most difficult because that ain't a whole lot. <laughs> you understand? I'm trying to explain. It just sounded print that, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, you don't have a whole lot of keyboards and three chicks going shoop shoop in a brass section and, you know, and tripled lead vocals to contend with, which is a whole lot to remember where everything is and what to turn up and what to turn down and how much echo to put on this and not on that and how much bass and everything. You see, I deal with this in very basic terms. You know? But at the same time, if you just record a bass, a lead guitar, some drums, a drum, -er, and one singer with possibly backup vocals. That is not a whole lot, and that's going to sound real thin mm -hmm. unless you know what you're doing with those sounds, which is why we pay so much attention to initial sounds. When we get in the studio and you're you're, you're making each instrument sound the way you want, you have to know how to make that bass sound big according to your taste, mm -hmm. but you, know, you, you, you have to fatten that bass up through the board, what you have on the board there, so that it doesn't sound thin and toy-like. You know, mm -hmm. Tinky music, quimp tone, we call it. <laughs> There's a lot of guitars. Now, in a lot of songs and kinds of music, quimp tone is okay. It's great. It's a necessity. There are certain kinds of old blues numbers or in some reggae or something where you need real quimp tone that, you know, that, I don't know, maybe it's a fender with something that's not turned up very loud and, it, and you're banging at it hard like it was mm -hmm. turned up loud. We call that quimp tone, Q-U-I-M-P dash tone. And, it, you know, but you can't have that with Van Halen can't have that and so you have to pay strict attention to what that guitar is like. and that's where Teddy Templeman and engineer Don Landy are the kings you know they're really there's no such thing as the best but they are definitely up there because they can you know it sounds big live so why shouldn't it sound big on plastic mm -hmm. or tape yeah. and that's it's not as easy as it sounds it's not as easy live either you know, we went through seven sound men on our first tour because even though you don't have all those extra instruments and things to remember during the performance, you have to know how to make that bass come alive and you have to know how to translate those drums through a PA system. It's the same thing for recording. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're great at it. And as a result, we don't have to overdub on 93% 
of our material mm -hmm. on any of these three albums. It's uh, it's just it's translated online. You hear a lot of people do that, and then you and you get the distinct John Bonham feeling, <laughs> you know, after listening to the drums or something. Mm -hmm. And I mean, John Bonham or Jimmy Page, whoever invented that, that's great. They invented that. Let's hear something new. I want something new right now. And I mean, yeah, I'm a great consumer. Have you noticed? <laughs> you know, and uh, you know. We've managed to get a big sound without sounding like somebody else, for mm -hmm. better or worse. Van Halen sounds distinctly like Van Halen. Mm -hmm. And if you hear anybody else try and sound like Van Halen, you will know who they're trying to sound mm -hmm. like. Just like there are many artists, Hendrix or uh, Clapton or whatever, who you could hear the song, not have heard the tune before, and before the vocals even come in and go, oh, I know who that is, or I'll bet you that's, mm -hmm. you know? Nowadays, you hear 900 bands who sound like somebody else, and you don't go, oh, that must, well, I don't want to name bands. Let's call them uh, Ricky Red Spot, you know? <laughs> oh, that must be, that's Ricky Red Spot. You go, oh, no, that's Deep Purple. That's Ricky Red Spot sounding like Deep Purple. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, even that can be entertaining, but it's not as great as something that's, different mm -hmm. you know it takes on an appearance of being very different mm -hmm. at least is the band there during the mix down process? sure sure and uh giving suggestions yeah but it's uh it's pretty obvious i mean if what you're involved in the whole process it's not obvious from the outside but teddy's very involved with the you know the music and the, during the rehearsal and the recording process and he comes and sees us live and he's like another member of the band mm -hmm. and and he you know he works very closely with uh, Don Landy and they you know they get a sound together and and to the, uh, those of us in that circle it's very obvious what needs to be done you know it's outside of it it's like oh a revelation or something you know but inside like i said when i hear the music you know uh i just it's obvious to me that what it's about mm -hmm. and it's the same kind of thing in the studio you know make sure you print that all together that it's it becomes obvious if you're in that circle because when you start with it right when the song starts just when it's written and you live with it until it's finished recording and that kind of thing, then you know kind of where what needs to be loud and what needs to be soft because, I don't know, for some reason we just all look at each other, the band and Teddy, and, and smile or get pissed off together. <laughs> you know, there's very rarely a division. You know, when it comes down to a vote or anything of that nature, it's very rare that we would, there'd be a division maybe one person, mm -hmm. but you figure you've got a great board of directors there, man. Yeah. So, you know, if it gets by most of us, it's probably going to be a hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have a Van Halen albums in your collection, Hope? Do I? Would you sit, would you sit down and listen to Van Halen album? No, no. I, I sing it all the time. Uh, most of the year, you know, when we're out on the roads and stuff, and, uh, you know, I hear it when we do interviews at radio stations and this and that. I like to hear other new things. I am uh, uh, real hungry for new things all the time of all types, all kinds of music. And uh, I consume tapes. What I use Van Halen tapes for is I get a bunch of them from the warehouse and then trade them. <laughs> See, and then, you know, I just, I consume tapes like, hey, I'm the world's greatest consumer, man. I'm the biggest groupie of all. I listen to all kinds of tapes and stuff. By the, by the way, these guys, out of all the groups that I've ever been backstage on the road, these are the only guys that have their own customized sound system in their dressing room. That, they got the, what is it, the tuner, the preamp, the amp, the maze, yeah. the speakers, it's, it's all... It's the biggest case in our dressing room. It's the Van Halen backstage sound system. It's great. And this year we're using two of the bass cabinets that Michael used on stage last season. Big with uh, Yeah, with mid speakers and tweeters and all horns and all that stuff. And extra power, just the biggest uh, speaker and biggest... <laughs> 
cabinets in the dressing room. And that way we always have music and warm-ups. You know, we put the mats down and everybody tapes up their feet and their knees and you know, jumps around. <laughs> Full blast music. I take that back. It was the biggest uh, cat packing case in the dressing room. The bar is going to be the biggest <laughs> packing case in the dressing room this tour. We're having one specially made by Anvil, three-piece case, you know. But, hey, man, you live out there, right? You know, you were the modern gypsies, man. You use a suitcase instead of a tent, and you just, you travel around, and that's my living room. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. come on in. <laughs> is anybody else involved in any other projects outside of the band? Anything you'd like to do or you'd like to do? Or? It's taking up all our time now. You know, just uh, there's so many different things to do. And Van Halen handles every aspect of its uh, career. You know, whether it's deciding when we want to go on the road to what kind of clothes we wear to, you know, working with Teddy on the sound of the album. It's, uh, we handle everything. So there's a whole lot of different things besides just singing and dancing to do. And it's very exciting because if you see an advertisement for Van Halen, we were involved in putting that advertisement together, what the picture will be, what it will say, what the advertisement is for, when it got put in the magazine, we get involved in all of that. And it's, that's real creative, man. Just, you know, it's all pictures and words and music and movies and stuff. That's great. That's a very exciting biz to be in, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you go on the road, you play a show. Show is, what, an hour and a half, two hours, something like that, you know. And it's that's a couple hours out of 24. I mean, so you can get involved <laughs> in all kinds of other things, the photography or the cinema. Or, it's all involved with the band, but it's all different parts of entertainment, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. <clears throat> It seems like something like you'd like to get involved in cinema stuff. And sure, well. sure. Well, we had a Van Halen movie. Uh, the three tunes that were on uh, Don Kirshner's mm -hmm. uh, Midnight Special or whatever it is <laughs> this week. And it's like, and it's, uh, you know, and, and we were completely involved in that. We decided we wanted to do all live we wanted to shoot it live we wanted to record it live live sound which we never had before and uh that's what we did we got five cameramen and shot a couple of shows that were really live and even though it might not have been as perfect as say you know in the studio man you know doing a video you could see all of the people and the action and what it really was which is uh exciting to me and and uh we put it on TV. There's nothing like dreaming, having a few beers and a pizza or whatever and dreaming up something and then watching it on television six months later, you know. That's very exciting. It's a, you know, you can create that sort of thing on stage. You can create the movies to advertise it. You can create pictures to send out to people. You just sit around and dream stuff up. To put it bluntly, that's what I do for a living. You sit around, dream stuff up. Would you have ever dreamed that the band would be this successful? Mm -hmm. You did? But not this quick. I always knew because our crowd was always growing. We always worked at it. We didn't want to you know, take a demo tape to record companies or something, knock on people's doors, because if we figured that if we were truly if we were good enough to sell records and to travel around the world, that we would get discovered. And if we didn't get discovered, it would be because we weren't good enough. And so we advertised all of our own shows. You know, we'd rent halls and set up flatbed trucks for the stage and get lighting and shit and put on our own shows and we'd play the clubs and the bars and the following kept growing which was what the whole idea make the following grow and that <clears throat> if you hit people up enough if you excited people enough they would talk and that eventually the record companies would hear about it mm -hmm. and the press did and on and on and on until you get discovered and signed and on down the line, you know, and uh, it's kind of an ultimate test, you know. It's one thing to make a demo tape, take it to a record company, they reject it, say, Well, the tape wasn't produced right, 
you know, or it was the wrong time of year to take a tape to them, or they aren't buying this kind of music this this week, <laughs> you know, or there's a vinyl shortage tomorrow, or or or, you know, that's that's an easy way to cop out and never really never really get out and do something, you know. And uh, you'll know quick if you're not cutting it. If you're just trying to build a following and get noticed from that, you'll know real quick because there won't be any people there if you're not cutting it. <laughs> you know? And I see a lot of new wave bands. A lot of the rock bands are doing that same thing now. And uh, I think it's great. You get out As long as there's the places to play, and there are, there are a lot more places to play now for an up-and-coming band than there were when Van Halen was up-and-coming before we got signed. And you get out and I see posters everywhere and flyers and leaflets. And I think it's great. That's the way to go. That's the way to go. Been in New York City many times now and there's plenty of places to play there too for an up and coming man of any nature, of any kind. And uh, it can be done. You know, you get discovered. It's not as, it's, it's like, it's like a movie and it isn't. You know, you, you work at it, man. And the way, and you prove yourself. It's a scary thing for a lot of musicians, is to put yourself right on the line, and and you don't do some real incredible show. If you base your show on personality, you don't deal deal in spectacle. You know what I'm saying? And to put your personality on the line without the big demo tape and the hustle and friends of friends and stuff like that. And if it doesn't happen, what are you going to do? You're going to push a broom. You know? So that's a scary thing. It's a lot easier to take a tape out. And if they reject the tape, to blame it on one thing or another. Or, you know, one preview show, you do it in a SIR rehearsal studio and have five people come in and watch three songs and reject it on that basis. Well, it was too cold outside. Well, we didn't play good that night. Well, I... You know, I had a cold, whatever it was. But if you just base it on, we're going to build the following, and they'll hear about us if we're good enough. And that's a scary thing, but I see a lot of bands doing it now, and I think it's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. Did you get that all on tape? You're yeah, in the bank there. I can tell yeah, you. I'll put the tape in the bank.